be mine. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mate. It's a podcast where we will help you learn to invest in 20 minutes or less. We break down the world of investing from beginning to dividend so that you can hopefully make some returns. My name's Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going, bro? Very good, Bryce. How are you? Good, mate. Good. Ready to crack into something that we haven't done on this show before. It's a brand new segment. We introduced it midway through last month and because it's the first episode of of November it is time to do book club <laughs> yeah <laughs> we need we need like a jingle or something here we do we'll get yeah. one of our mates to whip one up <laughs> yeah 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 well you did you did half a percussion degree maybe you can uh I can do half a tune us. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so as we sort of discussed maybe three or four episodes ago First episode of every month, we are going to do a quick review on the book that we have finished reading for the previous month. And for the month of October, I firstly hope that some of our listeners joined along and read it with us. We read Michael Lewis's book, Liar's Poker. Uh, He he was the author of The Big Short, which is now a really good movie and well worth watching. Um, And Ren, this was one of your picks. And it's all about life on Wall Street as a bond trader and... Got to say, it was pretty entertaining. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Michael Lewis's books generally are. He also wrote Moneyball, if people have seen the Brad Pitt, uh, Jonah Hill movie. I'm pretty sure they star in it. (laughs) Um, Anyway, (laughs) so, yeah, look, uh, before we get into the book, I think it's probably important to reiterate why we're doing this. You know, reading is, for us, we found it so valuable and all of the people that we interview through this podcast just say the same thing over and over again, that the reading um, both books and investor letters and stuff like that has just been of exponential value to them. And we wanted to create a create a, this book club to help our listeners come on that journey, to recommend some books um, and sort of create a communal feel around it. So we're going to be reading them every month. We hope that you join us and we hope that you benefit from them. And if you have any suggestions for books, we're definitely all ears. Um, but we're yeah, all eyes. We're all eyes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Liar's Poker. Yes. Um, I thought poker, is, isn't that tautology? Like, po- poker is, part, part of that is lying anyway. There's no, no, su- no such thing as honesty poker. Honest poker. What a boring yeah. game that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's start when Ren addressing Lies Poker. What is Lies Poker? So, it's a, it's a game that these traders would play. And if any, if any of our listeners have played Perudo with dice, it's a, it's a similar game to that. But essentially what you do is you pull a note out and every note has a serial code on it, a string of numbers. So, you have nine numbers on an Australian note. And everyone else has the same nine numbers. You need to guess out of that total uh, how many there are. You, you start your bid um, and then everyone has to one-up you. So they either have to say there's more of that number or there's X amount of a higher number. So you've got to keep one-upping each other and then eventually someone will call bullshit and then you'll see how many there are. <laughs> All right, so everyone gets what what it is now, hopefully, from Ren's explanation. So oh, I, I don't even think I get what it is from that explanation. <laughs> but um, if if you want to understand it and uh, play it and become a bond trader, uh, just Google Perudo or Liars Poker or or read the book. Even that that's probably what we should recommend. <laughs> yeah. join the book club and read the book. <laughs> Oh, God. So, do you want to give it a crack, Ren? Well, uh, the more I think about it, the more I think it's just not going to translate over audio. Okay. Um, should we try? No. Oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, go on, go on. Give it a crack. All right, all right. You've I'll got start, a $10 note. I've got a $10 note. We've yeah, both got... So, so I've only got eight digits on mine, though. Okay, so you've got eight digits. I've got nine. No idea how that works. That 17 is on the table. Yeah. <laughs> yep, all right. I'm going to say there is... Uh, Six fives. Six fives. I'm going to say liar's poker. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, kind have... of a, 
<laughs> I don't you have don't any have fives. Any. Oh, no. I only have one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa. Ballsy move from you. Anyway, so that's how it's played. So I would have taken Renner's $10 note there and yeah, we would have yeah, played yeah. on again. So <laughs> Let's get back to the book. <laughs> yes. It starts with the the head of this bond trade. Well, it's about this bond trading firm, Solomon Brothers. The, it starts with the head of the firm challenging uh, one of the head traders to uh, one game, million dollar game of Liars Poker. And the head trader says, sure, but it's got to be 10 million. And the, uh, the head of the firm backs down. And yeah. that, so, that sort of gives an insight into the, uh, the testosterone fueled trading floor that was Salomon Brothers in the 80s. Absolutely. Yeah. So, why, why did they write the book? Why did he write the book? I think, well, he sums it up in the end pretty nicely. You know, he goes on to talk about how, despite all the fact that, he, you know, there was all this money to be made. So, he was a graduate. Uh, at the time that this book was written and, and when he finished and left the company, I think he'd been there for two years and was one of the highest paid employees for how far he had been into the company. He made a you know a bonus of a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but he said that uh, despite all the, the testosterone and the money making and the fun and the partying and all that sort of stuff, at the end of the day, it just wasn't uh, meaningful for him and and it wasn't his sort of direction in life. And I guess the whole book sort of leads up to that point and really outlines what it was, what life was like on Wall Street as a bond trader. Uh, and there's some pretty interesting and sort of exaggerated in- examples in there of, of what it was like, um, which I found really interesting. Why do you think he wrote the book? Oh, well, I think to tell, to tell the story of Solomon Brothers is probably to tell the story of Wall Street in the 1980s. And given that he lived through it, it's, um, he had a pretty interesting perspective. Mm. So for background, if people haven't heard of Solomon Brothers, they were a bond trading firm, an investment bank on Wall Street. And in the 1980s, the, um, they essentially invented the mortgage bond. Um, I mean, mor- mortgage bonds existed before but they weren't big until the 80s. And this one trader, Louis Ranieri, Ren- who, if you've seen the big short uh, features in the start of it, he created this mortgage bond trading unit, convinced all these banks, especially like little savings and loans banks in America, to trade to the point where um, in 1984, this is from the book, in 1984, Ranieri could argue plausibly that his mortgage bond department made more money than the rest of Wall Street combined. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, so they were just raking it in. And and the numbers were... So in 1977, uh, American savings and loans banks uh, held about $12 billion in mortgage bonds. By 1986, that was up to $150 billion. So more than 10x increase in mortgage bonds being held by these banks. Um, and that just shows the the growth of the industry. And Michael Lewis had a front row seat to a lot of it. Yeah, very interesting. So talking of Sol- Solomon Brothers, they did eventually decline and fall apart, which we'll probably get to. But one thing I found interesting where you said, you know, it probably sums up Wall Street. Something that did differentiate them from Wall Street was, and this is from the book, Solomon Brothers was the only major firm in Wall Street in the early 80s with no system for allocating costs. As unbelievable as it seems, there was no measure taken for the bottom line and people were judged on the sum total of the revenues on their trading books, irrespective of what cost it would generate. So, or it generated to to get that revenue. So I found that pretty interesting, the very loose management style that eventually ended up to to being their detriment, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It all did fall apart. So the book, the book finishes in what, like 1988, 1989, Solomon is not doing as well. They they had a massive purge where they just gutted their a lot of their traders and they yeah they just cut a lot of their staff. Uh, what we don't read in the book is after that in I think like the early nineties they got done for uh, rigging treasury bond auctions 
and there are basically rules around how much you can subscribe to the auction because say if you if you control 90% of the treasury bond auction then you can uh, manipulate the price uh, and so treasury put rules in Salomon were breaking those rules to have more of the auction to be able to like squeeze out the shorts and stuff like that they got caught uh, a couple of people went to jail the head of the bank got fired and um, actually Warren Buffett was brought in to uh, write the shit and uh, that was a whole saga in his life and then eventually Solomon sort of faded into the background and got bought out by another company and then got bought out by Citigroup so didn't collapse but never got back to their high-flying mid-1980s ways. No. Nah. Dead as a doorknob. So Ren, yeah. I guess to summarize for me, I've got, I have three points that I, I took away from it from a learning perspective. One is when a lot of people are after the same commodity, it largely becomes overvalued. That was straight from the book. Yep. Uh, two, rumors move markets. So it's important to separate the noise. And three, there is no master of the markets. Do you have any learnings before I go on to my final one, which is to See if you pass the investment banking quiz. <laughs> oh, I'm nervous about this. I guess one, I have one uh, person that I found really interesting and then one big learning. Um, okay. So John Merriweather is, uh, he's one of the key traders in this book. He's actually the person that gets challenged to the game of lies poker at the start of the book. Yeah. The name probably isn't familiar to a lot of people, but he, he was a really influential sort of quant trader in the 80s. And started a quant trading unit at Solomon that made a lot of their money after, especially after the mortgage bond department sort of fell apart. But then, if anyone has heard of long term capital management, John Merriweather left Solomon to go and start long term capital management after this whole uh, treasury auctions scandal. And then, long term capital management also almost brought down the entire financial system in the 90s. So he's a fascinating character and someone that uh, I would suggest reading about. He He's had an interesting career, to say the least. But anyway, so yeah, I found him really interesting. I would love to interview him on Equity Mates, but I think we'd yeah. have to get a, a little bit bigger first. Yes. <laughs> and then my, my key takeaway was just when you read this book and you visualize his trading floor, all of their incentives are so short term. Their positions yeah. are held for days, if not minutes. They are churning through their book and they have just good information flow. They have a lot of capital behind them. And when you read that and you think about how you're on the other side of some of these trades, you're not going to beat them in the short term. But because their incentives are all so short term, there's not a lot of long term thinking in how they position themselves and how they try and you know, buy things that will compound over a long period of time. So I think it just reinforced to me that the one advantage that we have over these massive institutions is we're not subject to the same short-term performance pressures that they are. We don't have to report quarterly. We don't even have to report annually. So we do, that is the one advantage that we have over them. And that's not going away. And I think you need to take full advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. It was pretty grotesque in some parts where they, especially when they were talking about junk bonds and forcing these bonds on customers who would pay just so they can either get it off their books knowing full well that it's a, a, a piece of junk and so that they can pocket a couple of million in commission for, you know, it was, it was not great to see in some, in some aspects, but Ren, so yes. <laughs> right, at, right at the start of the book, as I said, Michael was a graduate at the time. He started in their internship program and, and their what seemed like a pretty intense period of training. And he was talking about the interview process to become an investment banker. And I found this very interesting comparing it to what you have to go through now to become an investment banker. So I'll just read from the book. Uh, yeah. although, although I wasn't ready to be an investment banker, I was in a funny way prepared for my interview. I had memorized these few facts widely accepted by Princeton undergraduates to be part of an investment banking interview survival kit. Investment banking applications were expected to be cultural. You were expected to be culturally literate. For example, 
in 1982 at least, they had to be able to define the following terms. Ren, <laughs> will, will you pass an investment banking? Oh, no, in, no. <laughs> ready? Hard yeah, work. Yeah. Hard work. <laughs> Stock. Bond. Private placement and partnership. Could you Am I actually just defining them? <laughs> well, I mean, could you define all of those without fail? Uh, hard hard uh, work, stock, bond, private placement. Partnership. Um, yeah, the only one that's maybe subjective is hard work. Like, <laughs> how do you define it? But True. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could define the others. Yeah, so, I mean, what a stitch up. Imagine if it was that easy these days to uh, waltz into a to Macquarie <laughs> Bank or, or, you know, Goldman Sachs and all you had to do was uh, sit down and define hard work, stock, bond, private placement and partnership. I mean, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought you were actually, I thought this was going to be a hard test. I was geeing up for something. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I scared you there a bit, but no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. No, well, Bring back well, the yeah, 80s. They, they were saying that, um, that like Lewis Ranieri's mortgage trading department you know like none of them were sort of university educated at least at the beginning no. they were just you know guys who were you know hustlers who fell into this and um they they were they were traders that that's what they were they weren't you know trying to outsmart people they were just trading yeah. and then sort of you sort of see this move towards quants and john merriweather brings in a bunch of um like university academics and stuff like that and it's a different way of trading and looking at the market Hmm. But yeah, well, let's go. Nice. Uh, let's go tell Goldman that we can define those five terms and see if they'll offer us a job. Get us on board. I'll even yeah. define a sixth term. Oh wow, will you? Which one? <laughs> I don't know. Investing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ren. So let's wrap it up there. We now obviously are moving into November, and we've got another book. What are we reading this month, and where can we? And where can our listeners get it? So this month, we are reading one of the investing classics. Uh, it is The Little Book That Still Beats the Market. Uh, it's just an updated version of Joel Greenblatt's classic, The Little Book That Beats the Market. If you haven't heard of Joel Greenblatt, his fund, Gotham Capital, returned uh, an average of 40% over 20 years. 40% annually over 20 years, which Ridiculous. is just absurd, like... Buffett is mid twenties, obviously over a longer period of time, but still forty percent over annualized over twenty years is just uh, it's crazy. Phenomenal, so, phenomenal. Yeah. So jump. This is the time to join the book club because this is going to be a good read. It's it's got a great reputation. A couple of our uh, interviews have recommended it. So jump on our website. You can um, you can see our well, you can see our book club page. You can uh, buy the book. You can join the book club and you can listen to the episode, first episode of December, where we'll be discussing uh, Joel Greenblatt's book. Yeah, perfect. So I'm looking forward to the read, Ren. Lies Poker was a great start. Hopefully this takes it up another level and uh, can't wait to discuss it in December. We'll talk then. Yeah. We will talk before can't then. Can't wait. We'll talk books then. <laughs> <laughs> Equity mates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.